I want you to know something, that, that the promises of God oftentimes precede the miracles of God. And there, there are things that we become desperate for, things where we just need God to do this, or we need God to do that, we need him to move. And there are often times where all we have to hang on to are a word from God, a promise in his word, a promise in scripture, something that someone has shared with us, like encouragement from the Lord, encouragement from his spirit in a time of prayer. Because it seems to me that the promises always proceed. It seems like the miracles can take time. The, 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 the word or the promise can come quick. And I think that, that what we have to understand in this story is that true faith is simply taking Jesus at his word. This is the essence of the Christian life. We live by faith, not by sight. In other words, we, we understand that what we see in the natural is not all that there is. That what, that what we hear people, people are going through, what we hear in terms of like what doctors say, you know, when, when we hear diagnosis, when we hear people who are struggling and relationships that are broken and marriages that are falling apart and hopeless situations, like we understand intuitively as followers of Jesus that what we see in the natural is not all that there is because we walk by faith, not by sight. Hey, uh, we are uh, continuing on a teaching series this morning that we uh, began last week, a uh, collection of talks uh, that we started called Heaven on Earth, and uh, really excited to uh, get back into that uh, here today. Uh, we are specifically looking at the Gospel of John, where there are seven miracles of Jesus uh, that he highlights, that he uh, you know, kind of, kind of uh, uses as like signs that point to who Jesus is. Uh, really was. And uh, this series is going to lead us all the way up to Easter Sunday, all the way up to uh, maybe the greatest miracle of all time, right? The resurrection uh, of Jesus. And how many of y'all know that the Bible is a book that is full of miracles and that our God is a God of miracles? Y'all understand that? Okay. Um, the Bible, you read it and it's full of all of these sort of like hopeless situations. There's these tough circumstances we read about. There's a lot of different trials. There's traumas going on, and, and you read, and it's like every single time just about God steps in, and he does something that like nobody saw coming. God steps in, and he, he does the impossible. It's like his track record. It's, it's who he is. It's what we read about. It's what we see all throughout the scriptures. Matthew gives us a summary of Jesus's ministry here on earth. Uh, Jesus, uh, at about 30 years old, began his ministry and, and uh, for about three, three and a half years, he did unbelievable things. In Matthew chapter four, we're given like a summary of really all that Jesus did uh, as he you know, walked the earth. It says this in Matthew 4, uh, 23, that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing, everybody say, every, every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all, all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. This is like a summary statement of Jesus' ministry here on earth. Uh, let, let me basically just kind of put it in our own terms, okay? The summary of Jesus' earthly ministry is really this. He preached the kingdom, healed the sick, and cast out demons. That's essentially what Jesus, Jesus was about. And so what I want to do this morning as we're in this series called Heaven on Earth, I want to spend a little bit of time specifically talking about the topic of healing. Now, this is a topic that I know can be controversial uh, for people, especially in a room like this, where we have people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different even church paradigms. And as a result, we may have some differences in perspective on how to come at this idea of heaven on earth, miracles and healing and all of that stuff. But I want us to kind of like start here with this sort of big idea around the supernatural, this sort of big idea around miracles. It's what David Hume says. He says, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. That's what it is. There's no other way to explain it. It's a violation of the laws of nature. And so, like, this is what Jesus was doing. When we read the Gospels and we see him go from town to town, from person to person, and do the impossible, he quite literally was violating the laws of nature. There was no other way to explain what was going on other than, like, this should not be able to happen, and yet somehow Jesus is making it happen. He, time and time again, he healed the sick and the crippled. He cast out demons. He commanded, uh, you know, nature uh, to obey him, and it did. Uh, he even raised the dead, you know, just kind of took it up a notch. So let's, let's try that one. Um, and so 
I, I tell you all that, and, and we're going to push into this idea because when you look at Jesus' ministry, right, when you just read it objectively, when you read what's going on there, when, when you look at the ministry of the apostles, and then you kind of look at the church, uh, the global church, both then and now, uh, I think this is what we see, that healing was and still is the primary marker of the kingdom of God breaking in on earth as it is in heaven. It's the primary marker. Like, you know, this idea of, of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven on earth, heaven come. Like the primary like, like marker, the primary thing we look for when we see whether or not heaven has come to earth is, you know, is God moving powerfully in people's lives? Is he, is he healing the sick? Is he uh, saving those who are lost? And, um, and these are examples of the kingdom of God breaking in to earth. Let me just make a very clear statement on illness and disease really fast. I want you to know that illness and disease are not a punishment from God, but they are an opportunity for God. You really got to understand that. When you think of like, the characteristics of the kingdom of God, um, it, you have to understand that like healing, or I'm sorry, that sickness and disease are, are not characteristics of God's kingdom, like whatsoever. John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief or the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Man, illness, disease, sickness, those seem to be right up his alley. I don't know. Uh, Jesus says, I've come that you may have life, life to the fullest. And so the kingdom of God is the reality of God bringing about his will on earth. The reality that Jesus is announcing as he goes throughout saying the kingdom of heaven is near, the kingdom of heaven has come near to you, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is proclaiming that the kingdom of God is like here. It's right here. It's this idea that, that Jesus is speaking to that the kingdom of God exists in both the now and the not yet. Not yet in the sense that we are still waiting for Jesus' eternal rule and reign. You know, that still has not happened. And so the kingdom of God in some sense is not yet. But it is also now in the sense that, that uh, the kingdom, uh, there's kingdom power available to us right now. That, uh, that we are then, as a result, called to have great expectation for what God is going to do in us and what God is going to do through us and great expectation to see God move powerfully in our day and in our time. So the kingdom of God, it is now and not yet. It's it's available to us now, but we still eagerly await in anticipation for the fullness of the kingdom of God here on earth. So why did Jesus spend so much time healing in the gospels? Because I believe the reason is that because it's the primary marker of the kingdom of God breaking into our world. It's just, it's just like, Wow, like that just happened. Jesus, when he's healing people, he's literally restoring things back to their natural order. He's saying like, like, like the, the world since the fall has been kind of, kind of tilted, sort of cockeyed, not working right, broken. And every time Jesus moves miraculously, he is restoring what was lost and what was broken back in Genesis chapter three, and he's restoring it to its natural order. You see the kingdom of God is, a, is an announcement for sure. Like we are to announce the kingdom to people. It's an announcement, but it is also an invitation. The kingdom of God is an invitation to experience life the way that it was intended to be in the first place. See, I gotta, I gotta make something very clear this morning. You gotta understand that Christianity is not a belief system that you agree with in order to be saved from this place in order to go to heaven after you die. That is not the message of Jesus, everybody, okay? Let me, let me show you what the message of Jesus is. Look at this. The message of Jesus is that heaven is invading earth and we are invited through relationship to live the way that we were designed to live in the first place. Catch this. The kingdom is not an idea or a subject, but it is something that is presently at hand, meaning you can grab it or touch it because the kingdom of God is a reality to be experienced. This is, this is like the kingdom of God. This is, this is what it is. It's not some like abstract thought or an idea, like, like somewhere out there in some different dimension or realm, God is at work. It's no, 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 the kingdom of heaven is near. It has come to you. It is here now. There is, there's, there, there is a, a powerful way to live and exist as Christians in the here and now. And so this is what the kingdom is. And yet I think for a lot of people, this concept of the kingdom is kind of like trying to explain a song to someone who's never heard it. 
I think sometimes that's the challenge for me, like, like even just in, in terms of preaching or teaching or pastoring, is like trying to help people understand something that maybe they haven't experienced yet, trying to explain a song to them that they haven't heard, trying to help them get, get like a vision for the kingdom, even though they haven't experienced the kingdom. See, I can, I can come to you and I can explain like the lyrics to a song that you haven't heard. I can like maybe hum the tune. You probably wouldn't want that. I could break down the history of the specific uh, music genre. I could, uh, I could try, try my best to sing it for you. But, but how many of y'all know that the whole point of the song is to hear the music yourself? And so when it comes to the kingdom of God, the whole point of the kingdom is to experience the music yourself. It's not just for, for me to kind of come up here and explain some things to you each Sunday about the kingdom. It's not, it's not j- just, you know, for me to come up and even give you like some, some, some Greek and some Hebrew, uh, you know, which, which, you know, probably isn't even that great anyway, like when I do it. But, but, I mean, just to give you like some background and some history and all of that stuff, uh, it's not enough. The whole point of the kingdom is that you would experience it yourself. That you would, you would walk in this stuff yourself, that it wouldn't just be, again, like abstract somewhere out there, but it would be something that you, that you possess, something that you live out, something that you, you give away to people that you come into contact with. There's a, na- a man by the name of Matt Emmons, and uh, he is a, an American uh, rifle shooter. He's com- a competitive rifle shooter. He compete- has competed in four straight Olympic Games um, He's won the gold, he's won the silver, he's won the bronze. In 2004, Matt Emmons was preparing for his final shot uh, in competition. And uh, at the time, he was so far ahead of the other competitors that all he had to do was place his bullet anywhere in the inner ring of the target, and he would have uh, had the gold. And so as he prepares himself, he pauses his breathing. And if you don't think about like competitive shooting, which I read a little bit about, uh, uh, these guys actually learn how to pull the trigger in between heartbeats. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's like down to a science. It's pretty incredible. And, and so he, he pauses himself, right? He, he, he steadies his breathing. He takes aim, pulls the trigger. The bullet passes right through the bullseye. It's a perfect shot. Matt Emmons, all of a sudden, he's, he's confused because, you know, he doesn't hear the usual tone indicating a hit. You know, that sound didn't occur after, after his shot, and soon he realizes that the bullseye he had hit was on the wrong target. And unfortunately, as a result, he drops from first place all the way to eighth place, well off the podium. It's a fascinating story because he's actually one of the, one of the, the, the most accomplished, um, you know, shooters in, in competitive uh, you know, rifle shooting, and, and yet in this uh, Olympic Games, he, he hits the wrong target altogether. And I tell you that story because I think this is an example for the church in the West. I, I, I think that for a long time, we have celebrated maybe hitting the bullseye on the wrong target. I think we've created environments that are nothing like what Jesus intended the church to be, and then we just celebrate it. And just as the right shot hitting the wrong target will not win you a gold medal, I think, I think equally people living off mission, and in this case the church, will not accomplish the, pur- the purpose for which they were created. You see, I want to start this morning with an assumption, baseline assumption that I believe, that I carry with me. Just in my understanding of the Gospels and when I read them, I believe this is what the target is supposed to be for us as followers of Jesus. Look at this. The church, in my opinion, this is the, this is the target We are called to continue the ministry of Jesus today through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the target. To walk in in the very same power, to walk with the very same eyes, to look at people the very same way, to to have this this power to continue in, in the work of the ministry of Jesus, to do what Jesus did. Scripture is very clear that we are called to do the very same things. And yet for a lot of us, this just is not our experience, is it? You see, I think, I think a few things here. I think, that, I think that the ministry of healing is supposed to be ordinary and normative and expected by followers of Jesus in the here and now, but it's not. Oftentimes we're just surprised when you hear like, oh man, that prayer like actually got answered. Like, wow, that's amazing. Did you hear that? Like, instead of it being like, no, we expected that. We knew that was going to happen. Like, we're, we're, we're taken by surprise. 
And why is this? Why is, is, is maybe where our expectations should be not where they are? And I think, I think it might be this. I think that, that perhaps cultural Christianity is the biggest threat to heaven being experienced on earth. And what I mean by cultural Christianity is a consumer-oriented Christianity that makes Jesus more of an accessory than Lord. This is where he is a subscription service that you only use when it feels right and never when it's painful and never when it's challenging. It's the type of Christianity that has no effect on your finances. It's the type of Christianity that has no effect on your time, on your relationships, or even on your sexuality. It's like window dressing, spiritual window dressing. Charles Kraft talks about it this way. He says, it's interesting and, in, and discouraging to know that, that even though we are Christians, our basic assumptions are usually more like those of the non-Christian Westerners around us than we would like to admit. Even though there is a wide discrepancy between the teaching of Scripture and the common Western assumptions, we often find ourselves more Western than scriptural. Western societies passed through the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and a wide variety of ripples and spinoffs from these movements still exist today. The result, God and the church were dethroned and the human mind came to be seen as savior. So cultural Christianity, so, so, so what, what, what really is it? It is, it is, in effect, making Jesus into our own image and then calling it Christianity, which at its best is nothing more than lukewarm spirituality. And Revelation talks about that, right? That like lukewarm isn't, isn't the way to go, <laughs> right? Peter, Eugene Peterson, um, he talks about this idea of consumer spirituality this way. He says, he says, the cultivation of consumer spirituality is the antithesis of a sacrificial deny yourself congregation. A consumer church is an antichrist church. We can't gather a God-fearing, God-worshiping congregation by cultivating a consumer-pleasing commodity-oriented congregation. And when we do, the wheels start falling off the wagon, and they are falling off the wagon. I love this last line. He says, we can't suppress the Jesus way in order to sell the Jesus truth. So there is a way of following Jesus. When you read about his life in the Gospels, it's like this is who he is. This is what he does. And it seems like, it seems like in some ways, like, like we have maybe become comfortable with sort of suppressing what it means to like see Jesus move in power and to see him do the things he's famous for in order to, to kind of package up the truth of Jesus and just give that to people and say, hey, pray a prayer and uh, that'll get you into heaven someday. You see, the way of Jesus, man, it is, it is the way of self-denial. It's the way of taking up your cross and following him. The way of Jesus is, is, is the way of healing and transformation. It is disrupting the natural laws with supernatural outcomes. It's proclaiming the kingdom. It is healing the sick. It is Casting out demons. That's what it is. And today, what we're doing is we're continuing a teaching series called Heaven on Earth. And every time we see amazing, these amazing things happen, what we would call miracles, like it is a, an example, it is a piece of heaven that has come upon somebody. You pray for the sick and they get healed. This is a piece of heaven that is like it's come upon them. They've been made well. Today, what we're doing, we're just continuing on in this, in this series. And in the Gospel of John, we read about all of these out of the ordinary uh, inexplainable miracles that Jesus just became incredibly famous for. Uh, repeatedly, right, people became shocked and amazed by what they saw him do, and quickly he, began, he, he gained this sort of, you know, reputation for healing the sick and the crippled, calming the forces of nature, like having command over them. It's, it's pretty amazing. Like setting people free from the bondages of evil and even raising the dead to the point that his disciples one day, like, look at each other, and, and there's all this confusion on their face, and they ask the question amongst themselves, who is this man? Like, we thought we knew who he was, like, all this time, and he just did that? And, like, I, I got no idea. Like, do you know who this is? See, Jesus grew up in a town called Nazareth. He was up in the northern region of Israel in Galilee, and he had a, a pretty normal childhood from what we understand. Most people had no idea who he was as he was of being raised, and uh, what we read about in the Gospels is that at just the right time, when he was all grown up, he stepped forward and was baptized by John the Baptist, and as a result, he was filled with God's Spirit, and then he began, little by little, to reveal who he really was to the world. 
And in John 4, I want to talk about another story today of Jesus doing an amazing, an amazing miracle. We see him perform uh, a miracle that, that is, uh, uh, and it kind of just like boggles the mind a little bit. It teaches us a lot about the type of faith we need and the kind of expectations we should really have. And so we're going to look at a story today involving uh, a man who was a royal official in Herod Antipas's court. Herod Antipas was uh, the king of the Jews at this time, but he was the son of Herod the Great, who was the king of the Jews when Jesus was born, that we read about in the, in the birth narrative. His, so Herod Antipas's dad was the one who ordered the execution of all the boys two and, 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 and under, right? So uh, Herod Antipas is the king, and his, he's got a man in his court, a high-ranking official, royal official, who travels uh, all the way from Capernaum to Cana, which is about 20 miles, in order to find Jesus because his son is very sick with a fever, he's close to death, and they desperately need a miracle. It says here in John chapter 4, verse 46, that once more he, Jesus, visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, which we talked about last week, his very first miracle that he ever did. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. I want to kind of just stop right there because we're just sort of getting into the story. And it's really interesting because you have this royal official, this man who has a great need, a son who is close to death. He comes to Jesus like you would expect someone to do who has a need like this. He's desperate. He's begging. But Jesus really begins to rebuke him and those watching. That's, that's how he starts, with a rebuke. He's, Jesus is rebuking those who depended on signs and wonders before they would ever believe. Because here's why. Oftentimes, people want to see miracles, but they don't always want to see God. And Jesus knew this. He knew this. Like, you want me to move in your life, but you don't want me to be Lord of your life. You want me to do the things, you just don't want to make me king of your heart. Like, Jesus understands that, like, people want the power of God, but not necessarily the person of God. And so he's rebuking them here in this story, saying, man, you're just coming to me, and all you just want to watch me do miracles, and that's not what it is. Don't you understand who I am? You see, the father in this story, the royal official, he's come to Jesus because he needs the power that Jesus has to heal his son. And it's important for us to understand that at first, this man is no different than anybody else watching who just simply need a sign in order to, to believe. In fact, look at this. I, I think initially this man's belief extended only to Jesus as a miracle worker. That's why he's come to him. He's heard some stories of Jesus as a teacher. He may have even heard about how he turned water into wine a few weeks ago. Pretty amazing. He's heard about Jesus' his teachings when he was down in, in Jerusalem. Hey, hey, this guy's gained a, a following. And he's come to get a miracle for himself. Now, at this point in the story, the royal official doesn't believe in Jesus as Lord. But it's important for us to recognize that he does have some belief. He doesn't believe in Jesus as God or Jesus as his Lord, but he has some level of belief. He evidently believes enough in what he's heard about Jesus to walk some 20 miles to see Jesus for himself and to beg him for help. There's clearly a level of desperation going on here that this man is feeling. But what you gotta, you gotta notice here at the beginning of this story is that the miracle is the motive. The miracle is the motive for this man. For this royal official, the miracle is the motive. He sought out Jesus for what Jesus could do for him. He's desperate, and so he comes to Jesus, and he, he begs, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's amazing to think about this, especially when you understand who this official really, really would have been. You notice how he doesn't appeal to Jesus on the basis of his noble status, his, his relationship to the king. He doesn't appeal based on that. He, he appeals to Jesus on the basis of his son's great need. And we know, we understand that this was a pretty important man, yet there was nothing he could do to make his son well. The son is sick, and he is going to die. The royal official could have come to Jesus, and he could have offered him money. Money wouldn't have been a problem for the royal official. He's going to have enough of it. But even with all the money and all the influence that he possesses, he is unable to purchase a miracle. He is unable to purchase his son's health. He's realizing that. 
Let me just say it this way. This royal official comes to Jesus because for all of his wealth and status, he does not possess what is needed to fix his problem. He's, he's like, come to the end of his rope, basically. He's, he's tried it all. There's nothing else he knows to do. He's exhausted all of his options, and he's come to a point where he realizes that, like, man, man it's either Jesus or, or nothing. Only Jesus can do this. So he comes to him, and he begs, and he pleads because his son is at the point of death, and the extreme need that the royal official has is, is the reason for there being like so much urgency, so much desperation in his voice. You can kind of just, just pick up on it, right? And, and he's thinking like, if he could just get Jesus to come to his house, Jesus could make his son well. If I could just get Jesus to come back with me, if he would just go back on this journey for 20 miles back to Capernaum, like man, everything would be good. He, he, he was desperate in this moment because his son is quite literally at death's door. And so he's begging that mercy's door would be opened to him and to his family. How many of you know what desperation like this feels like? Anybody in the house? You know what desperation like this feels like? Desperate for God to intervene in your life. You see, the royal official would have been used to giving orders and telling other people what to do. But when he comes to Jesus, he doesn't give Jesus orders. Instead, he begs Jesus to travel to Capernaum with him to heal his son. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because there's, there's just, as I was reading this and reading through the seven miracles, and there's really more like 40 of them in the Gospels that we read about that Jesus did, I, I, I began to just notice something. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but nearly all of the healing stories of Jesus are interruptions. Nearly every one of them. Again, it's not like Jesus has nothing to do. It's not like he has no place to be or no place to go. It's not like he doesn't already have plans. But time after time, people come to Jesus and they interrupt him. We see it all of the time. We see this like, you know, the woman with the issue of blood, like Jesus has is, is, got his back to her. He's walking in another direction and she comes and touches the hem of his garment and power flows out of him to heal her. Like we see him interrupted all of the time. He makes time for these sort of divine interruptions for people who are in need, for people who are desperate. Because with Jesus, like where he is going and what he has to do is never more important than the people who are in need. And I think that you gotta maybe know this about Jesus today, that he, he allows us to interrupt him. Like it's, 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 it's like amazing. It's a beautiful part of who he is. Like he wants us to interrupt him, to come to him with, with our issues, to come to him with the stuff that we need, like the, the, the struggles that we're carrying, like, and, 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 then, and then also, but to be, the, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the people we're supposed to be who continue on the ministry of Jesus, you know what this means? It means that we have to be people who are able to be interrupted as well. And I think, I think part of the, the, the tragedy of that is that most of us, like, we schedule our lives to the point where there's zero margin and there's no opportunity to be interrupted, or we stand in line at the store staring at our, our phone and, like, we don't see people around us. It, like that even if we were to be interrupted or, we're, or, or God wanted us to be interrupted, God wanted us to give you know, the hope of the kingdom of God to somebody in need, like we couldn't because we either don't have time for it or we don't, we're not looking for it. Jesus wants us to interrupt him, but I think he also wants us to be interrupted, to look for the divine interruptions in our day where we can give hope to people goes on, and in verse 49, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. In verse 50, Jesus replied, You may go, your son will live. And then it says, The man took Jesus at his word and departed. You notice in the story how the royal official does not get what he asks for. The royal official would have expected Jesus to go with him back to Capernaum. He would have expected Jesus to come with him and to heal his son in person, but Jesus does not follow, uh, volunteer to return to Capernaum with him. That's, that's not what's going on here. Instead, he just decides to give the royal official a promise that his son is healed, and the man believes Jesus and leaves to return home. I want to just give you a thought today that I think is, is, is really big, and maybe some of you need to hear this. See, I think that the promises of God always seem to precede the miracles of God. The promises of God always seem to precede the miracles of God. You have to see how the royal official begins his journey home without Jesus. You have to see that in the story. He, he begins his journey home without Jesus and without proof that his son was actually healed. 
All he has is a word from Jesus, but he has nothing to verify that the miracle has actually happened. And he turns and, re- and, and begins his journey home. I want you to know something, that, that the promises of God oftentimes precede the miracles of God. And there, there are things that we become desperate for, things where we just need God to do this or we need God to do that. We need him to move. And there are often times where all we have to hang on to are a word from God, a promise in his word, a promise in scripture, something that someone has shared with us like encouragement from the Lord, encouragement from his spirit in a time of prayer. Because it seems to me that the promises always proceed. It seems like the miracles can take time. The, the, the word or the promise can come quick. And I think that, that what we have to understand in this story is that true faith is simply taking Jesus at his word. Simply taking Jesus at his word. It says the man took Jesus at his word and departed he departed towards home. Taking Jesus at his word, man, that's so much easier said than done, isn't it? When we take Jesus at his word, that means that we actually believe that he is who he says he is. That we believe he can do what he says he can do. That he keeps his promises. That he is good and true and right. And in the story, Jesus severely tested this man's faith, forcing him to believe in Jesus' word alone and not in any outward demonstration of the miraculous. He doesn't see anything change. He's 20 miles away, doesn't have a phone to call and ask if the miracle actually happened because, you know, that's probably what I'd do. You know, like, like Jesus it, it gives me a word. Yeah, your, your daughter's healed. Like, thank you. Let me just call and verify because I'm not leaving here until I get my miracle. You know what I mean? I'm not leaving here until I get what I came for. And we see the man do this. He, just, he, tr- he takes Jesus at his word. He doesn't have proof. He doesn't have evidence. He has a word. And he returns home, believing that Jesus keeps his promises. Think of the trust involved in taking Jesus at his word. He turns and he walks back the 20 miles. I like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith, not by sight. This is the essence of the Christian life. We live by faith, not by sight. In other words, we we understand that what we see in the natural is not all that there is. That what what we hear people people are going through, what we hear in terms of like what doctors say, you know, when, when we hear diagnosis, when we hear people who are struggling and relationships that are broken and marriages that are falling apart and hopeless situations, like we understand intuitively as followers of Jesus that what we see in the natural is not all that there is because we walk by faith, not by sight. Man, I want you to know that there has been far too many days of my life where I have walked by sight and not by faith. Maybe some of y'all can agree and know what that's like and you can relate It's so easy for us to look at our circumstances and let those become reality and let those things become truth. Jesus says, hey, I want you to see it all. I don't want you to to ignore the things, but I don't want you to live by those things. I want you to live by faith, not by sight. If you've ever been desperate for God, anybody ever been just desperate for God? You ever been desperate for God? Then you have probably learned this truth, that you often need to go through the night before you can arrive at the miracle. You often need to go through the night before you can arrive at the miracle. This this royal official doesn't get home until the next day. Uh, We don't know if he immediately turned around and went home or if he decided to stay the night. Either way, like, you know, he doesn't get home until the next day. He has to go through the night. It's the next day he gets home and he finds out what's what's really uh, going on. Um, And I I think that means something to us because the night or the darkness doesn't mean it's over. You gotta gotta catch that. Like, I don't know where you're at right now in your journey, in your story, or whatever it is, or if you've got something you're praying for or holding on for and need God to do this. Just because it's dark doesn't mean it's over. Just because it's night doesn't mean it's all over. You often need to go through the night before you can arrive at the miracle. And for this man, his faith continues regardless of what he sees. He keeps walking towards home. And oftentimes what I have found is that there seems to be a great distance between the promise and the miracle. And in this case, it's 20 miles. For me, it's felt a lot longer than that, a lot further than that. Sometimes there just seems to be this great distance between the word and the result. 
and faith in his word, faith in Jesus and his word and what his promise is, it's what gets us from the promise all the way to the miracle. I'm taking him at his word. He is who he says he is. He does what he says he's gonna do. And I'm taking him at his word. You see, faith is something that involves action. And it grows when we begin to act based on God's promises to us. Right? That's, that's what it is. Again, it gives, we're living by faith, not by sight. And so it's the promises of God that we begin to act on before we have evidence that they're even going to work. That, they're, that we even know. They may, I saw this work for you, but it doesn't seem like it's working for me. It's faith. I'm acting on the promises of God even when I don't see evidence of change. This is the way we live. And some people say that faith is blind. I'd say that faith is never blind because we know where our faith is pointed. It's not just blind, ridiculous faith. It's where it's pointed at something. Faith means believing God's word. Sometimes there's no evidence that God's word will come true, but because it's God's word, we believe it and we hang on to it. We know the famous saying, like, I'll believe it when I see it, but Jesus wants us to believe first without seeing, only by taking him at his word. In John chapter four, the rest of the story goes on in verse 51. It says about this royal official that while he was still on the way, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. So, He's not even all the way home yet. Something has happened in Capernaum so miraculous that his servants begin running towards Cana to try to intercept the royal official and bring him the good news. In verse 52, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. They what? They believed. And it says that this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. So here in this story, we have uh, quite literally a long-distance miracle. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, so Jesus speaks a word in Cana, and it happens in Capernaum about 20 miles away, right when he spoke it. Pretty amazing. It's a long distance miracle. And I think what this does is it, it builds our faith in a lot of ways. Um, not only can Jesus do anything he wants to do, and he's not, he's not limited by time and, and distance, right? Like we, I think a lot of times we, we you know, can, can struggle with like, how can God do that? How can he bridge that gap? How can he do something over there that far away? It just shows us Jesus is not limited by time and distance and that there's nothing he can't do. But it also should cause us to kind of think a little bit differently about our own prayer life and about, about how we pray and about how we live and about what is true uh, in how we think about, about the, the power of God to affect people and change them and heal them and set them free. Like I can literally pray right here and somebody not in this room, somebody far away, they can experience like healing in their body not because of me or anything that I've ever done, but because God is not limited by time and distance. There's nothing he cannot do. See, healing at a distance would have been a sign of very, very great power, as you could imagine, because it meant that his power um, could act elsewhere when he wasn't there, so this would have been a power that only God would have had. And here we see that Jesus himself has it as well. I love this story. It lines up really well with Psalm 107, which says, He sent forth His word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. I use this verse a lot sometimes when I'm praying for people who are sick, because oftentimes when I'll be praying for them, I'll just simply ask God to release a healing word from heaven. Say, God, would you just release a word right now? A healing word from heaven over them right now. Because your scriptures tell us that you sent forth your word and you healed. You healed them. You healed them and you rescued them from, from the grave. And, you know, we, we want to have great faith that God still does long-distance miracles, that he still sends wor a word. He still declares healing over people and sets them free. He still tells us to go. Your son is healed. Your daughter is healed. Your body is made whole. 
the thing that you need the most, it has happened. You guys can go ahead and, uh, and start making your way up here. I want you to, to catch just a little bit here before I close. I'm, I'm right at the end, but uh, John 4, verse 53. You, you can't put this story to bed without catching this important piece. It says about the royal official, so he and all of his household believed. They believed. This is, this is speaking specifically to like salvation. They, they've believed. So what we know in this story is that, is that prior to this moment, getting back home, this man was not a believer in Jesus, neither was his entire household. But after all of this goes on and this encounter with Jesus takes place and the journey from the word to the miracle happens, something supernatural has happened in this man's life and in those of his household that they have decided to believe in Jesus as their Lord. See, the man first believed Jesus' word, but then he came to believe in Jesus. And that's the difference. And in today's passage, we see a man who approached Jesus looking for a miracle, but he walked away with a renewed soul. Now, I want you to catch something very, very important here. The moment he believed, look at this thought. The moment he believed, his faith had now found the right object. Not a miracle, not even a promise, but Jesus himself. You see the progression in the story. At the very beginning, he's put his faith in a miracle. Like, I just need a miracle. I've heard Jesus can do it. I'm going to go find him. That's the object of his faith. And then he gets a word from Jesus. Your son is healed. And now he starts the journey back home. His faith is now in a word that he received. But by the time he gets home, he sees that his son is made whole. His faith has moved from a miracle to a word. It is now, it is now uh, faith that is put in to Jesus. He, he, he believes on Jesus. His faith is in Jesus himself. Jesus, by the end of the story, has become the object of his faith. He believed that Jesus is believe Jesus' word that his son would live, and as a result, and he experiences an even greater miracle, he and his entire household believe. And I, I'm so grateful for all the amazing stories in the Bible about the miraculous power of God, and I'm amazed that he still does the things today. But don't be mistaken, there is no miracle that he has ever done that is greater than the miracle of salvation. To bring people from death to life, to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, to take us from being dead in our sins to being alive in Christ. There's no greater miracle you can ever read about, no greater miracle you can ever ask God for, no greater miracle you can ever experience yourself than that. But that's not all he does. His kingdom is here and it's coming. It's now and not yet. It's advancing. It's taking back ground. It's breaking in. And so I don't know what's going on in your life today. I don't know what your story is, but maybe you do have a relationship that is, that is broken. It's struggling. Maybe it's with your, your children. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with parents. I don't, know, I don't know the story, but you know that quite literally right now, you need to experience heaven breaking in to that relationship. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you've got anything in your body that's not working right. Maybe, maybe you just deal with pain, chronic pain, and you just need heaven to break in. I don't know if it's uh, you know, anything else. Maybe there's disease and sickness or illness going on in your family, in your life, and you're just, today you're like, man, God, I need, I need heaven. I need the kingdom of God to break in to my life. I need a piece of heaven to come upon me and my family, to come upon me and the situation I'm in right now. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if faith is difficult for you in this place because maybe you've had your eyes on everything else. Maybe you've had your eyes on everything that you see and, 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 and your faith as a result has maybe gotten smaller or it has shrunk. And today you need heaven to come upon your faith and watch it grow, watch it increase, watch it become greater than it's ever been before. You need to start taking Jesus at his word once again. You see, Mark Batterson, he says this, which I love. He says, if you seek miracles, you probably won't find them. If you seek God, miracles will find you. He is the object of our faith. He is the one that we look to. 
the one that we look for, the one that we believe still does everything that we read about in scripture, that he hasn't stopped, that it's not over, that he still moves powerfully in our lives. And yet like, like the, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace with King Nebuchadnezzar, we, we still have this whole, this whole attitude that even if he doesn't move in our life, that even if he doesn't rescue us, even if he doesn't do the impossible, we're still, gonna, we're still not gonna bow down. We're still gonna stand up. We're still gonna worship him for who he is, regardless of whether or not he ever moves and ever does another miraculous thing in our life ever again. So we, that's the tension, right? Like we, we wanna bring the kingdom. We wanna see him bring heaven to earth. But also, man, if I never see another thing, if he never does another thing in my life, like he's done enough, and it's, and it's not enough, I know too much now to ever be in a position of like bowing down to the idols of this world or the things that wanna keep my eyes away from Jesus. If you seek miracles, you probably aren't gonna find them. But if you seek God, miracles are gonna start to find you. Would you just stand with me here today? Would you just bow your heads for a moment as we uh, take a moment here? I just have a few questions for you. Where do you need to start to believe even though you do not see? You're here today and you would just say, Pastor Jordan, like there are just some things, like I don't see God working in this situation or in that situation. My faith is pretty low here. And, and it's time to start living by faith instead of by sight. Could I just see your hand today with every head bowed? Just wanna pray over you, wanna encourage you in prayer. It's time to start living by faith. Start living by faith. Let me ask you a question. Where right now do you need to start taking Jesus at his word? Where do you need to accept his promise and let that then begin a journey for you in the direction towards the miracle? Like, where do you need to start to take Jesus at his word? If you're here today and you're just like, Pastor Jordan, today, right now, I'm gonna start taking Jesus at his word. Can I just see your hand? I wanna see you today. I wanna pray over you. Thank you. Thank you. Remember, if you're walking through the night, if you're walking through the night, you're walking towards your miracle. Remember that right now. If you're walking through the night, you're walking towards your miracle. So Jesus, now we come before you. We ask Holy Spirit that you would just inhabit this room right now. Father, that you would step into the room right now. Lord God, would you begin to encounter every person who raises their hand, saying, man, I'm going through something. I'm going through something. I'm walking through the night right now. I just can't see as clearly as I need to. My faith is struggling. It's lower. Than, than, than it should be. I've been walking by sight and not by faith. God, would you just begin to just encounter every person in this room. May they experience and know and feel and understand your radical love that was poured out for them on the cross 2,000 years ago, oh God. Lord, I pray encouragement, deep encouragement into every soul under the sound of my voice right now. Would you lift every head that is downcast, that is discouraged, that is frustrated, that sees no other way. God, would you release healing and wholeness and transformation and life to things that are dead right now in Jesus' name? Would you take back now everything that has been stolen? Would you take back everything from the enemy that has been stolen? Every assignment of death and destruction, everything the enemy has done to kill, to steal, and to destroy, we ask right now, oh God, that you would take back everything. Take it all back. In Jesus' name, I pray life into this room once again. I pray hope into every spirit here today, oh God. There is none like you. You can do it. You're more than able. We put our faith in you. We fix our eyes on you right now. And we ask, oh God, for you to do the things. Man, just do the things you're famous for. Jesus. Jesus' name, amen and amen.